Preacher, I appreciate that. All right, take your Bible this morning and find your place in the book of Proverbs, please. Proverbs chapter 1. And I love the Proverbs. Uh, if, and I'm sure you've probably already heard this, but if not, I'll give you a little recommendation here for your Bible reading. And this is what I do. I've done it since I was, since I was, uh, since I was a kid, since I was in, in, uh, in school. And uh, I, I can't remember where I heard this from, but there are 31 chapters in Proverbs. Most months have 30, 31 days. You can read whatever day of the month it is. You can read a proverb. And uh, so you, today is the uh, 17th, read Proverbs 17. And uh, I try to do that every day. Read five Psalms, one proverb, and you can read through the book of Psalms and Proverbs every month. And uh, every month you can do that. And uh, it'll be a blessing to you. And I appreciate this, uh, this good book of wisdom right here, which is what we need. We need wisdom. And there are different kinds of wisdom. There's earthly wisdom and there is heavenly wisdom, godly wisdom. And earthly wisdom, well, it'll only get you so far but godly wisdom will give you a godly life and a life that honors God. And uh, so that's, that's what I long for. And I love the book of Proverbs. I'm going to give you just a quick thought out of here. Good to see you this morning. How many glad you're here? Say amen. amen. I believe most of you. I really do. I really do. Y'all look, uh, look like you're happy you're here this morning. Of course, I know it's early. We've been in revival all week for those of you who've been here, and, uh, and uh, it's early. So I think, we're doing, I think we're doing pretty good. Amen. I feel pretty good. I woke up and had a big, I drank a big uh, Coke Zero this morning, so I'm feeling good. Amen. Got some caffeine in me, and uh, I'm doing all right. But, uh, man, it's been so good to be here. I love preaching Christian school chapel. I really do. And uh, I went to Christian school. I, I went to public school till about sixth grade. My mom uh, is a public school teacher and she's still to this day. She's been doing it close to 30 years and uh, 20 something years, probably getting close to 30 now. And uh, she actually went to school when I was little. I remember her. I, I went to her college graduation, watched her graduate college and uh, start teaching. And when she started teaching in public school, she pulled my, me and my sister out and put us in Christian school. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, she did my sister immediately and me, she waited maybe about a year or so, a year or two. And, uh, and then pulled me out. We went to Christian school and I'm gonna tell you what, I absolutely loved it. I loved it. Now I'll tell you what I loved most of all was the chapel services. I love the school I went to kind of like this one right here, probably about this size. And it was in a spirit of revival. When I got there, they were already, I mean, young people just looking to serve God and man, we would worship chapel was like camp meeting. We'd worship and, and we'd shout and we'd get in the altar and pray. And we found out that if we get in the altar and pray a long time, we might, we might get skip math class right after chapel. So, uh, so I don't know. I think most of it was real, but I don't know. I think some of it might've been skipping a test or two, but no, I'm kidding. But man, God would just move and we'd have different preachers come and, and preach chat. And I'm going to tell you something. Listen, it changed my life. God changed my life in chapel services just like this. And, uh, and I thank God. I can still remember m a multitude of messages that were preached uh, during, those, during those years. And from seventh grade until I graduated high school, I was in that school except for one little, one little year uh, there. My mom brought us home and she homeschooled us. She just wanted to just see if she could, I guess. And she, she did. And, uh, but we went, back to, we went back and I graduated uh, from that, uh, that high school, that uh, Christian school. And I, I've been able to go back to that church, preach several revivals since. And uh, man, I'll tell you what, it's just a blessing. I thank God for the people that invested in my life. And uh, I'm, uh, I feel like a turtle on a fence post. How many of y'all ever seen a turtle on a fence post? Well, if you ever do, you'll know one thing. He didn't get there on his own, all right? Somebody picked him up and set him on there, all right? And that's how I feel about my life. And I'm nothing. I, I, I really am. I, I'm, not, I'm not much of anything at all. But anything that I am... I feel like I owe it to, to the Christian school teachers and to the, the church that had that school and the, and the pastor that had the vision for the school. And so I want you to thank 
thank your teachers. I want you to thank your principal. Thank uh, the secretaries. Thank the pastor. Thank him for, because it's a lot of work. It's a lot of money. And, uh, but I, I can tell you this, that it made a difference in my life. And uh, if you'll take in what is being given to you and use it, God will, God will bless you greatly. And I think about messages that were preached to me in those years. And there was a, there was a thing, there was a certain, probably four or five different themes that were preached over and over again, different texts, different titles, different, you know, illustrations, but kind of some of the same messages. And I, I began to catch on to that. And I thought, you know what? A lot of these guys come in here and they keep preaching the same things over and over. But what I didn't realize, and now I realize looking back, it's because those were some of the most important things that I would need. And I want to preach one of those themes to you. It's one of the, one of the main themes that was really ingrained into me. And I'm going to tell you what, it saved me from a lot of heartache and still is a lot of heartache and a lot of heartbreak. And I want you to listen real close. And I want you to think about what I'm telling you. And really it's not me. It's from the word of God. And I want you to look at the book of Proverbs in chapter one. If you're there, say amen. amen. And I want to look at just one verse, but leave your Bible open. We might look at a few other verses that surround it. But I want to look at just one verse, a li one little short verse. And some of you probably already have it memorized. If not, I want you to work on it and I want you to memorize it because I think it'll be a blessing to you down the road as you go. It's verse number 10, Proverbs 1 and 10. Here's what it said. Here's what it says. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Amen. I think we could probably memorize that right now. How many of you have already, have, already have that verse committed to memory? I thought so. I thought so. I think I remember learning this one too in school. Well, let's say it together, all right? Let's see if we can say it together from memory, or if you need to look at it, that's fine. Let's read it, all right? Ready? My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Let's do it one more time. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. I want you to remember one word this morning. Here's the word that I want to put in your mind. It's the word influence influence. That word influence just simply means it's actually the definition is kind of in how it sounds. If you think about that word influence, that word influence means it's an influence is what it is. Inflow. It means to pour into. That's literally what that word means. To inflow. Influence is what that is. Everybody that you come in contact with and everything that you listen to and everything that you watch, uh, uh, they all, all those things, they pour into your mind. They're pouring something, good or bad. Some of it's good, some of it's bad, uh, but they're pouring something into your mind. There's no contact that we make with hard, hardly any contact that we make with anything or anybody that has a neutral effect on our life. It's positive, it's negative. And there is a, there is a, a very, very serious, somber warning that's given to us in this verse right here about the kind of people that we allow to influence us and to pour into our lives. This is very important. Now, Solomon compiled most of these Proverbs or, 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 or wrote a lot of these Proverbs. They were compiled together and, uh, and, and, and they're put in this book of wisdom right here. It's very interesting. And a lot of these Proverbs and a lot of these passages are directed to a son, just like this verse, my son. It's a father speaking to his son. It's a dad speaking to his child. It's wisdom, a, a father trying to train up his child in the way that he should go. And it's interesting to me, out of all the themes that you'll find through the book of Proverbs, a lot of great wisdom on a lot of great subjects in the book of Proverbs, you'll find wisdom about uh, the tongue, the mouth, things, that, uh, the way that we talk, uh, money, how we handle our money, uh, 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 women, uh, work, uh, wealth, all kind. Of, there's all kinds of subjects in the book of Proverbs that there is wisdom given to us about. But the very first subject that Solomon deals with, the very first subject that is dealt with in the book of Proverbs is this subject of influence. The first nine verses are really uh, 
kind of telling us what Proverbs are and, and telling us general facts about wisdom. But when it gets specific and when it begins to tell us about, uh, about, about specific nuggets of wisdom that we need for our life, the very first subject that is dealt with is this issue of influence. And I would say that there is a there is a, an emphasis, there is a primary position, there is a priority that is given to this subject because it is a priority. Here's, what, here's something I remember from chapel. The preacher that used to preach to us a lot in chapel, if he said it once, he said it a million times, and it was ingrained in my mind. And I, you probably heard it, but I want to I emphasize it again, highlight it for you this morning. Here's what he would always tell us. He said, you win or lose by the friends you choose. You win or lose by the friends you choose. Never forgot that. Never forgot that. Here's something else he would say along these same lines. He said, you either are right now or you soon will become the people that you surround yourself with. I'm going to say that again. You either are right now or you soon will become the people that you surround yourself with. I can't tell you how many times over the years of pastoring and just being in church that I've heard people give, stand up to give a testimony of their life, salvation and, and their life and God working in their life. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard somebody stand up and with tears in their eyes, they get to a point in their testimony that they're embarrassed of and they're ashamed of. And a lot of times they'll say something like this. They'll say, you know what? I, I got in with the wrong crowd. I got in with the wrong people. I've heard parents stand up and, and weep over a child. Y'all pray for my, y'all pray for my son. Y'all pray for my daughter. They're, they're out in the world. They're, I mean, you know, they're not in church or maybe they need to be saved. And they would say something like this. He was a good boy. He was a really good girl. Uh, she just got in with the wrong crowd. She just got hooked in with the wrong kind of people. That's how powerful this thing of influence is who we allow to influence our life. Now, listen, I know right now for a lot of you right now, this is the case for a lot of you. It may not be for everybody, but for a lot of you right now, the case, here's the case for your life. Somebody else in your life is regulating influence in your life. I'm thankful I had parents that regulated influence in my life. I did. They, they, they limited what we watched and what we listened to and what we, I mean, all kinds of things. I, I've, had my dad, I've, I've had my dad come in my room before and say, well, what are you listening to? And he wasn't even that bad. It, I didn't think, you know, it was just maybe a little, you know, Ralph Stanley or something like that, some bluegrass, you know, or whatever. Y'all don't even know who Ralph Stanley is. That's good. That's probably good. Banjo player, bluegrass. It wasn't bad. It was just, you know, some bluegrass. Whatever. My dad said, turn that stuff off. Turn that stuff off right there, you know. I remember dad throwing the TV out of our house, you know, and then we'd bring it back to watch the Braves playoffs, and then we'd throw it back out. <laughs> the 90s you had to watch the Braves in the 90s but anyway and uh, <laughs> when I met, but 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 and, and then and, and obviously you know everywhere I went who are you gonna be who's gonna be there where are you gonna be what time are you gonna be there? and, and my, my parents regulated influence in my life and by the way I look back I ain't mad about it one bit I thank God for every rule every boundary every line because I look back and I think man that saved me from a lot of junk in my life I look over and I see even folks that I went to church with and, and folks I went to school with, kids I went to school with. I think, man, their parents let them do anything. They can do whatever they want. And I felt at times I felt so jealous. And I'm just like, man, they can just do whatever. They can watch whatever and read whatever, whatever they want. And I'm just like, man, what in the world? But now I look back and say, man, thank God. Thank God that there was a regulation of influence in my life. It's kept my mind from a lot of crazy stuff. And I thank the Lord for that. But as you get older, as you get older, you start getting a little more liberties, a little more freedoms. And then one day you're going to be out of here. One day you'll be out of your parents' house. And guess what? Now the choice is up to you. And I'm going to tell you something. I just want to just say just a few words just from that verse right there. Just give you just... I'm going to give you three words. I want you to write down three words 
Okay, they start with the letter D. All right, all these—it's gonna look like some of you's report cards. All right, we have it. No, I'm kidding. I hope not. I hope not. It's gonna be like this. Reminds me of my report card. No, I hope not. But let me give you three words, and it's right here in this, this little verse. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Here's the first word I want to give, and I want to emphasize a word in that verse. There's three words in that verse I want to emphasize, and I'm gonna give you a word to associate with it. All right. The first word is the word sinners. I want you to underline that word right there. And here's the, here's the word that starts with the letter D that I want to give you. It's the word discernment. And I want you to, I want you to think about that word right there, the word discernment. Because here's what the, 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 the father is telling his son. Here's what Solomon is telling his boy. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. He said they're sinners. There are a group of people that you need to watch out for because they will lead you down the wrong road. They will lead you down the wrong path. And he calls them sinners. That's who they are. And, and, and you have to be able, if you, cannot, if you cannot recognize who the bad influence is and what the bad influence is, then you will never be able to refuse the bad influence. You first must have to recognize it. That's what the word discern means. You know what discernment is? It's the ability to differentiate, differentiate between two different things. It's the, it's the ability to look at two different things and say, this is a plant and this is a pumpkin. All right. You can, you can, you can see they are two different things. That's discernment. That's all it is. It's to be able to look at two different things and say, this is this and this is that. And they are not the same. It's the ability to, uh, to be, be able to, uh, to, uh, uh have a, the right perspective about things. And here's what he says. He says, son, there are people in this world and though, and, and these people, they're going to try to get you to do things that you ought not to do. And these people are the kind of people that you do. Do not need to be hanging around and allowing to have influence in your life, to pour into your life and to have sway in your life. He said they're sinners. Okay. Well, we got a little problem. All right. We got a little problem. And the problem is this, is that if we're not supposed to hang around sinners <laughs> and everybody's a sinner, how I many of y'all know that? Right? Shake your head right there. Everybody's a sinner. Then what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to build a cabin in the middle of the woods and grow a big long beard? Don't do that, ladies, all right? Uh, and are we supposed to just isolate ourselves from everybody, you know, and grow our own food? I hope not because I need Chick-fil-A, all right, in my life. It's not a, it's not a want. It's a, it's a need. It's a necessity. Uh, anyways, or an addiction, however you want to look at it. It's a, it's a, one man's addiction is another man's necessity. All right. <laughs> Are we supposed to just say, I can't be friends with anybody. I can't talk to anybody. Leave me alone. Everybody get away from me, you know. No, because then you look in the mirror and you're like, ah, you got to get away from yourself. Because you're a sinner. But what, what, I know everybody's a sinner, but really, what do you think Solomon has in mind when he says about, when he talks about these sinners that his boy don't need to be hanging around? Well, what if I told you this, that there are two different kinds of sinners? Everybody's a sinner. But what if I told you there's two different kinds of sinners? I think you would understand this. First of all, there's the sinner who struggles with his sin. They have a desire to live right. They want to honor God. They sincerely, this godly sincerity, the theme for the year, they have a godly sincerity. That means they want to live for God. They're trying to do right. They, they really want to avoid sin. And they certainly don't want other people following them into sin. They wouldn't brag about it. They wouldn't boast about it. And they wouldn't entice other people to come join them and do it. But then there's another kind of sinner. And that's the kind of sinner that enjoys sin. 
They absolutely love it. They live for it. They don't give a second thought to violating God's word. Every time the parent, every time their parent's head or teacher's head or preacher's head is turned around, they're jumping right into it. They're running for it. They live for it. They love it. They live in it. They, I mean, they don't give a second thought to violating God's word and they want to get other people to do it with them and they want to just get everybody with them and persuade others to join them. And I'm going to tell you what, that's a totally different kind of person altogether. It's like, it's like, a, you know, a big mud puddle. I don't know what you do when you see a big pile of mud, but after you get a certain age, I understand, you know, I understand kids, my little, my little boy, he wants to jump right in it. If he sees a puddle of water or mud or whatever, he wants to go head first, head first right in it. And just, I mean, you know, make a big mess. But after you get a certain age, you don't like to get dirty, you know. I mean, not on purpose. Not, you know, you got your nice shoes on, clothes on or whatever. And so you see a mud puddle and you think, oh, man, I need to, I need to go around that. I don't want to get that on me. And so you go around it. Sometimes, though, and I, I've had this happen, sometimes I, pre I preached an outdoor meeting and it rained all week long. I mean, there's just mud all around and I'm just trying to get it out, messing up my shoes and my suit pants and everything. But, you know, sure enough, I got back to the room that evening and I splattered mud all up my suit pants just like that. And I thought, man, that's not what I wanted to do. That's not what, man, what in the world? And I'm going to tell you what, that, that's one kind of sinner right there. That says, you know what, I, I, I don't want to sin. I, I'm trying to avoid it. I'm trying to live right. But every now and then, I mean, I, I'm going to be honest, I get a little mud on me. But you know what I do? I get it right. And I try to get clean. And I, I don't, I don't want to leave the mud. I didn't wear that suit again until we got things cleaned up. I tried to get it cleaned up just as quick as I could. And because I don't want to be dirty. There's that kind of person right there. And then there's a pig. <laughs> You know what a pig does when he sees a mud puddle? He says, oink, 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 oink. I mean, I guess. I hadn't been around a lot of pigs, honestly. Just TV and stuff, you know. And then he jumps right on in. I can just imagine that pig just jumps in the big mud puddle. He wallers around and says, oh, this is the best thing in the whole wide world. And then he just leans back in that big mud puddle and says, whew, it's good to be home. They love the mud. Do you understand there's two different kinds of people? There's the kind of people they want to avoid sin, and there's the kind of people just always want to live in sin. Now, let me ask you this question. First of all, which one are you? Which one are you? We're all sinners. But which one are you? Have you been saved? Is there a change in your life and your desires and, and what you want for your life? And then secondly, I would ask, which one are you allowing to influence? Who, who are you hanging around? You know what Solomon said? He said, you can identify them by their words. We're talking about discernment, how to, how, to, how, to, how, to, how to pick them out. He said, you can identify them by their words. Look at verse number 11. He said, if they say, he starts saying, he said, Solomon said, boy, let me tell you what they like to talk about. He said, come with us. Let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privately for the innocent without cause. And you can read all these verses. He said, you'll know them by their words. Verse 16, he said, you'll know them by their walk. He said, for their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed blood. They go just as quick as they can to anything that is wicked and wrong. He said, you can tell them by their words, by their walk. He said, you can tell them by their wants, their desire. Verse 19, so are the ways that are of everyone that is greedy of gain. He said, man, they desire wicked things. What are their goals? What are they after? That crowd that you're hanging around, what do they like to talk about? What? What do they like to do? Where do they like to go? Where are the things, what, 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 what are the desires in their heart? What are the things that they could do if, 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 if they had freedom to do those things? I'll tell you, we've got to be careful. You know what we need? We need some discernment is what we need. 
You know what? God will give you discernment if you ask him. He will. God will give you some discernment. He'll, he'll allow you to say, you know what? If you're saved by the good grace of God, that means you got the Holy Ghost living on the inside of you. And he'll throw up some red flags. He'll throw up some red lights in your heart and say, you know what? You don't need to be hanging around that person right there. And by the way, let me just say this. I don't mean you got to be a jerk to anybody. In fact, don't ever be a jerk to anybody. I don't mean you got to be mean. I don't mean you got to look at somebody and say, you're wicked. I ain't hanging around you. Uh, no, you need to love people and pray for them and all that. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that they need to be influencing your life and allowing them to pour into your life. Amen. Because you win or lose by the friends you choose. God give us some discernment. All right, that's the first word. The second word I want to give you real quick, not only the word discernment, and I look at that word sinners. It stands out to me. I think, God, give us some discernment. We need to know who, 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 who's the right influence, who's the wrong influence in our life. Not only the word sinners, but here's the next word I want you to underline in that verse. It's the word entice. I want you to see that. He said, if sinners entice, and here's the word I want you to write down the associated with that word. It's the word deception. Deception, because that's what enticement is. Enticement is something that, that offers joy. It offers pleasure. It says, hey, come do this. Come partake in this and you'll be the most happy you've ever been in your life. But the idea of enticement is, is that what it offers is not what it delivers. It offers one thing. It promises one thing, but that's not what it gives you. Solomon's telling his boy, he says, listen, here's what these sinners do. They promise you, hey, come with us. Come have a good time with us. Come listen to us. Come partake with us. And all your wildest dreams will come true. You'll have so much fun. You'll be cool. You'll be accepted. You'll be popular. You'll be whatever it is. I mean, it's just the greatest life in all the world. But what happens is once you get involved, in it, and once you get entangled in it, you look around and you realize, uh, this is not what I thought it was going to be. Amen. An enticement. It's like a trap. Have you ever set a trap for an animal? We've caught mice in our house before. When we moved in our house that we're at in Alabama, it, man, I don't know what happened, man. We had first week or two, we, they were getting in. I finally found out where they were getting in and all this stuff, but we put out these little traps and, uh, you know, I think you're supposed to put cheese on it, right? On a mouse trap. I thought, man, forget that. I don't, that wouldn't entice me. I was trying to think like a mouse, you know. I crumpled up a fudge round and put it on there. That's what I did. I said, I know what mice want. They want little Debbies. Man, I caught, you know what I found out? Mice love fudge rounds. So do I. I almost got caught in the trap one time. But I remember, Chris, no, no, this is for the mice to catch mice. I caught myself. <laughs> we put <laughs> we put little Debbie on there. <laughs> But that's what it is. That, my, that mouse, when he, when he, you know, crawls up to that little, that little uh, uh, sticky, we got the little sticky traps, you know, the little glue trap. When he crawled up to that right there, he wasn't thinking, oh, wow, I'm going to jump on that and about rip my leg off trying to get off. He wasn't thinking about that. You know what he was thinking about? Mmm, fudge round. <laughs> Smells good. That's an enticement. That's why we put it on there. We didn't just set out a glue trap. <laughs> That wasn't a help. You got to put something on it. Fish, fish don't eat hooks. They like worms. You got to put something on it. You got to give them something to make them want to bite the hook and get on the hook. It's an enticement. What, and the reason you, you, you do that is because you want to promise them something wonderful. So they'll get on there. I'm going to tell you, listen to me. That's what sin does. If sin really showed you what it was and what it does, you wouldn't do it. Sin has to have, in order for it to be effective, there, ha, there is a built-in deception that goes inside of it. It has to do that to get you to partake in it and get you to be involved in it. And that's why all the billboards that show the, you know, they're drinking, they're, they're having a good time. They got all the pretty girls and they look so cool and they're having a great time and all this. Stuff. And they put it all out there and they say, man, you'll be in and you'll be popular and your life will be fulfilled. And, every, and, they, just, and they throw it all out there. But I'm going to tell you what, they don't show you the other side of that billboard. 
where there's a home that's absolutely horrible and daddy's beating on mama and mama's yelling at the kids and everybody's just, I mean, just miserable and there's no money for groceries because daddy spent all his money on, on beer and all kind of stuff. And man, they don't show you the, that part of it. I read uh, just, I think it was yesterday. I just read the headline. I didn't read the articles, but just the headline of a, of a pop singer. Uh, and I, I mean, it shows you, I knew, I knew some of the ones, obviously, when I was a kid. I don't know who this guy is, so that tells you how out of touch I am. I don't even remember his name. But he was popular maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, something like that. I really don't even know. But the guy was so messed up on drugs and alcohol. I think it was in Costa Rica. This just happened yesterday last, or, the night, or the night before. The guy was so messed up on drugs and alcohol that he jumped off the balcony of his third, of the third story hotel that he was staying at. The guy had everything that you could possibly want. They said, that one of the little, the little headlines I read, said he was there with his girlfriend and I saw a picture of his girlfriend. It's the kind of girl that anybody in the world would, you know, think, oh man, that would be amazing to be her boyfriend. They're out riding horses in Costa Rica. I mean, who gets to do that? Other than, I know your son just got back from Costa Rica. But unless you're the pastor's son, you know, and your dad's pastor of like a mega church in Baltimore, other than that, who, who gets to go ride horses in Costa Rica? You know, he's in this, I mean, they're eating steak and doing all this, uh, riding first class and, and flying first class and doing all this stuff. But the guy was so ensnared by drugs and drink that he flung himself off a balcony. Some of it was depression and some of it was just delusion. He didn't know what he was doing, but he was very depressed with his life and he had talked about taking his life before. I'm going to tell you what, sin offers a prize, but sin always has a price. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There's always a price tag of sin. And let me tell you something. It's always more than what it says on that price tag. Yes. Have you ever heard this? Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Yeah. You ever heard that? Sin will cost you more than you want to pay. Sin will keep you longer and you wanted to stay. I'm going to tell you, you play around with it, you think, oh, ain't, listen, I, man, nothing, nothing happened. Well, that's the way it is for a little while. And you have sin for a little while, but then one day you wake up and now it's got you. And you cannot break free. But that's not the way it starts. Deception. I just want you to know this, that sin always has a deceptive property and quality to it. James said, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And here's what he said. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Now listen, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The wages of sin is what? Every time. They're associated. You cannot separate the two. It's always that way. But here's, that's not the way it's presented. That's not the way it's offered. But I promise you, that's the way you'll look at it in hindsight. So he said, sinners. That means we need discernment. Who should we let influence our life and who should we not let influence our life? Then he said, entice. Entice. That's Solomon telling his son, boy, sin has a deceptive quality to it. Sinners, people that are trying to influence you to do wrong, they're deceiving you. They are not telling you the whole story, either because they don't know themselves yet or because they want to get you to be involved at any cost. And then lastly, the last word I want to emphasize in this verse, this little short verse, is the word consent. I want you to underline that. He said, my son, if sinners entice thee, here it is, consent thou not. Here's the word I want you to underline, or here's the word I want you to associate with that word right there. It's the word decisions. Decisions. So our first word was what? Do you remember? Discernment. That's right. Our second word is deception. And then our third word is decisions. Here's what he said. He said, if sinners entice thee, 
consent thou not. You know what that word consent means? It means to give agreement, to agree. Uh, I'm sure maybe if you, when y'all go on a field trip or something like this, I'm not sure how it all works, but I'm sure there may be some kind of a form that your parents have to sign that, like a consent form, something like that. You know, before you go, uh, uh, I went on this dangerous roller coaster one time. They had to, you had to sign a consent form or whatever, you know, hey, you know, if my head gets chopped off, I'm fine with it, you know. And I would be. If my head got chopped off, I wouldn't care. Amen. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so, so you sign a kid. That means I'm giving my agreement. I, I agree. That's what that means right there. I agree. You know what that means? That means the responsibility is in your lap. The ball's in your court. Yes, sir. That means that's your decision. You have to give consent. Nobody can make you do anything. Nobody can force you to do anything. They can put the pressure on you and influence you. But ultimately, at the end of the day, guess whose decision it is? It's yours. You win or lose by the friends you what? Choose. choose. It's your choice. It's your decision. And like I said, right now, a lot of the decisions are being made for you. But one day, those decisions will be yours to make. What are you going to listen to in the car when you're all by yourself? I remember thinking, I remember when I got, I got a truck when I was 16 years old. I, I had a job. I started working when I was 14. I saved up money. I bought my own truck. My parents never paid for anything. I bought my truck. I paid the insurance. I paid to put the gas in it. I paid for all of it. And so it's my truck. It's got my name on the title. I'm 16 years old. I'm driving that thing. My parents let me get it so I can drive. So my mom wouldn't have to take me and my sister to school anymore. So I'd drive, go to, drive to school. Because one day she was sick or she spent the night with a friend or something. I'm all by myself and I had no little sister to tell on me. No mom and dad. They didn't bug my car. As far as I know, I had a radio in there. And it, it, that thought occurred to me. I thought, you know what? I can listen to whatever I want. I already know. I saw the billboard. I know where Kicks 101.5 is on there. I know I could, I could turn that on right there if I want to. And I remember feeling the weight of that decision. It's my decision. What am I going to do? I'm going to tell you what, you're going to get to a place where you realize, hey, there's nobody here. I could do what I want. And then we'll find out what's actually on the inside. What's your want or want? And when you get to that place where you're all by yourself and you, could get, you think you'd get by with it and nobody would know, I want you to know that everything that you do, it will impact you down the road in some way or another. There's no free choices. They have consequences. And while you are free to choose to do whatever you want to do, you're not free to choose the consequences of those actions. Those are thrust upon you. Choose what's right. Do it because it's right. Do it because it honors God. And because even though somebody, your preacher may not be there, Sunday school teacher may not be there, mom and dad may not be there, grandma, grandpa may not be there, but the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. And it is something that will influence you and impact you for the rest of your life. It's so important what you decide to bled into your heart and let into your mind. You need to be careful who you let influence your life. Why don't we say our verse one more time and I'm done. He said, my son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Just say no. Joseph said no, didn't he? Jesus said no in the wilderness. You can say no. Let's stand together all over the building. Preacher, I'm done. The secret, secret to a happy life could be summarized in what he just preached. All the way back in the Garden of 
Eden, the devil could enticed Eve, made it look good, it was pleasant to the eyes. She ate it. It was death. Fruit was filled with death and curses, and suffering and pain and guilt and shame and heartache and tears. That one decision plunged all of humanity into the sin and the heartache that we're seeing today. Well, if you could get your heart and head wrapped around that message this morning, when the devil puts it in front of you, just say, nope, I'm not doing it. 